You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and I've got a special episode for you today. I'm traveling to Nashville to spend some time as a family, and that means today's going to be a little different because I'm recording early. We're going to focus on where are they now? Those who are left behind after a heinous murder, or those who maybe got away with a heinous murder. Let's jump in, and we'll start with O.J. Simpson's children. Such an appropriate update since this year, O.J. died from complications of cancer at the age of 76. The former NFL player shared three children with his first wife, Marguerite Whitley. Those children are Arnell, Jason, and Aaron. And if you raised your eyebrow when I said Aaron, so did I when I first did the research. Erin died a month before her second birthday when she drowned in the family swimming pool. All right, so the living children with Marguerite are Arnell and Jason. And then OJ, of course, had two children with Nicole Brown Simpson. Those two children are Sydney and Justin. And all four living children don't step out in the spotlight much. According to their aunt, Dominique Brown, they all prefer to live low-key lifestyles. Simpson had his first child and eldest daughter, Arnell, when he was just 21 years old. When Arnell testified at OJ's murder trial in 1994, she was in her mid-20s. She told jurors her father was emotional, distraught, and out of control when he learned of Nicole's death. Arnell seemed to never publicly waver in her support for her father. She spoke out again in his 2017 parole hearing following his prison sentence for a 2007 armed robbery at a Las Vegas hotel. She asked the parole board to release her father so that the family could move forward. She said as a family, they recognize that OJ is not a perfect man, but that as a father, he has done his best to behave in a way that speaks to his overall nature and character. She also called OJ her best friend. Now, his 55-year-old daughter was by his side when he died of cancer in April. So what about Jason Simpson? Well, he has a more complicated relationship with his father. At times, he was his sidekick, and then at times, there was distance. As a child, he was by his father's side during important moments, like when he was inducted into the Buffalo Bills Hall of Fame in 1980, and also important Hollywood moments like the premiere of Naked Gun 33 and a third. Now, that premiere was just three months before Nicole Brown Simpson was murdered. Jason was 24 years old when he attended nearly all of the trial for his father. Now, Jason is an adult, has struggled with his mental health, and has even described himself as someone whose emotions can vacillate wildly, from rage to calm in a matter of moments. And conspiracy theorists have said Jason was actually the murderer of Nicole Brown Simpson, but no formal investigation was revealed about Jason being the potential murderer of both Nicole and her friend Ron Goldman. Now, People Magazine reports that Jason is a chef at an Atlanta restaurant called St. Celia. All right, that leaves us with Sydney Brooke Simpson. She's now 38 years old. She is OJ and Nicole's first child and was only eight years old when her mother was murdered. Her aunt, Tanya Brown, who is Nicole's sister, primarily raised Sydney and her brother following Nicole's murder. When Sydney was 14, her and her brother moved to Florida, where they embraced a life of anonymity. Sydney graduated from Boston University in 2010 with a degree in sociology. She briefly lived in Atlanta before returning to St. Petersburg, Florida. Sydney has made her career in real estate and she owns several properties in Florida. And that leaves us with Justin. This is OJ's youngest child. He was just five years old when his mother was murdered outside of the home where he was sleeping. Now, Justin, like Sydney, works in real estate and has been employed as an agent by Coldwell Banker. He also owns several properties in Florida. Two years ago, Justin announced on Instagram that he was going to be the father of a baby girl named Lana. And since you might be asking, OJ's first wife, Marguerite, is still alive. She is now 75 years old and lives in California. She did remarry. All right, let's move on to another famous crime. So what about the West Memphis Three? 
I feel like I need to give you some background on these three men who were found guilty of killing three boys in West Memphis, Arkansas in 1993. Okay, it was nearing the end of the school year for the three eight-year-old boys, Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers. The three boys had attended school that day, and it is thought that the three eventually met up in the afternoon hours of May 5th to hang out together. Some neighbors said they saw two of the boys together. Some said they saw all three together. As evening approached, Christopher Byers' adoptive father called police at about 7 p.m., reporting his son missing. Police made cursory searches that night, but friends and family of the boys searched more extensively. A more thorough police search for the three boys began at about 8 a.m. the next morning. Searchers began focusing on a wooded area called Robin Hood Hills. They combed the area that the boys were reported to be seen, you know, hanging out in, and they walked shoulder to shoulder, but the search revealed no sign of the boys. Then at 1.45 that afternoon, Steve Jones, okay, he's a juvenile parole officer who was aiding in the search. Well, he spotted a boy's black shoe floating in a muddy creek that led to a drainage canal in the Robin Hood Hills area. And you guys, it's muddy, like chocolate milk muddy. Steve Jones entered the water and began feeling around with his hands. He eventually found all three boys naked with their wrists tied to their feet by shoelaces. So right wrist to right foot, left wrist to left foot. Their clothing was found in the creek, twisted around sticks and forced into the mud so that it wouldn't float to the surface. Now, despite being found naked, there were no signs of sexual assault. This was not how law enforcement presented it, though. Law enforcement seemed to float that theory to anyone who would listen. The boys did have multiple wounds, and it is hotly debated if the wounds were caused by animal predation, like maybe turtles in the water, or if the wounds came from the murderer or murderers. Investigators began speaking with neighbors of the three boys, and they quickly turned their sights to three teenage boys who had some troubled pasts and some minor brushes with the law. The three were very low on the social economic scale and were spoken to multiple times by law enforcement without counsel present. 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly, who was reported to have an IQ score of around 72, gave multiple and meandering confessions to authorities that linked him and 16-year-old Jason Baldwin and 18-year-old Damian Eccles to the murders. Hey, we've got those three boys all linked together by this kind of questionable confession by Jesse Miss Kelly. Now, Jason and Damien were the closest of friends, but mentally compromised Jesse Miss Kelly was kind of more of an acquaintance to the two. He didn't hang out with them, and Damien and Jason didn't quite fit into the Bible Belt culture. They wore all black and often had trench coats on and did just about everything with their appearance to make law enforcement look sideways at them. Not excusing law enforcement here, just painting a picture. Now, the combination of the three murders and the scare of satanic panic of the time led law enforcement to what some might call tunnel vision, zooming in on Damien Eccles especially. Damien met with officers several times, the first time being just two days after the boys were found. Damien took a polygraph test and authorities said he failed the test epically. That test has since been viewed as faulty. Damien also mentioned in one of the interviews that one of the boys had been mutilated. The authorities took that as guilt, despite the fact that dozens of people knew what the three boys looked like when they were pulled from the water. And during those multiple confessions by Jesse Miss Kelly, he recanted, then added, then changed his story. Um, police, well, they only recorded portions of the interviews that were full of detectives leading Jesse through the confession. Jesse was tried separately from Damien and Jason. Jason Baldwin was sentenced to life in prison, and Damien Eccles was sentenced with the death penalty. Now, for the last nearly 20 years, the conduct of law enforcement has been questioned, including the interview techniques, the narrow focus, the fumbling of the crime scene, and missed opportunities of finding evidence. Most people became familiar with the case after the HBO series Paradise Lost, which has been credited with the initial interest in the case and also the initial scrutiny. In 2007, DNA evidence from the scene was finally tested. 
and none of it matched the three teens. Then, in 2008, it was revealed that the jury foreman had discussed the case with an attorney before deliberations began. Now, this misconduct included sharing the false confession by Jesse Miss Kelly, which had been ruled inadmissible in the trial for Jason and Damien. So the jury knew the confessions existed, even though they weren't supposed to reference them in the trial. Well, finally, in 2011, Damien, Jason, and Jesse were released from prison as part of a plea deal. The three entered into an Alford plea agreement. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, the judge vacated the previous convictions and the three men each entered a plea to lesser charges. In an Alford plea, you accept that the court considers you guilty, but you aren't admitting to guilt. You're just accepting that they think you're guilty. Now, the three were sentenced to time served, and they began their first experience of adult life out of prison. These teenage boys, who are now men, had served more than 18 years behind bars. Okay, so why take the plea? Well, the men wanted out of prison, and this was a way. But also, two of the victims' families had joined the defense side of this fight, saying that the three men were wrongly accused and convicted. Also, fiber evidence gathered from the boys' homes and used in the trial had been found to be faulty. But here's the kicker. As part of the plea deal, the three men couldn't pursue legal action against the state and local law enforcement for wrongfully incarcerating them. All right, that is such a brief retelling of the West Memphis Three. There's so many podcasts and docuseries that are available. If this sparked your interest in what I have found to be such a like a reflective case of how some are considered disposable in our legal system, I challenge you, search out those documentaries. So where are they now? That's the point of this update. First off, the three are not done fighting. Just last month, nearly 30 years after the boys were murdered, the Arkansas Supreme Court has ruled that new DNA testing of evidence from the crime scene can proceed. The request by Damien, Jesse, and Jason had previously been denied by a lower court. Damien has led the effort for the testing, specifically DNA, that is embedded in the shoelaces that were tied around the wrists and ankles of Stevie, Michael, and Christopher. And ironically, the Attorney General of Arkansas was disappointed in the ruling because he said he can't retry the case because the three would have too high of profile of attorneys and he wouldn't be successful. Oh, so when they were poor, when they were nobody teens, the case worked in the judicial system. But now that they have an army of people behind them, the case can no longer work. Now, Damien, he lives in New York City. He has a website where he explains and advertises his practice of black magic. He says black magic saved his life while in prison, keeping him sane and with a purpose. He met a landscape architect while in prison named Lori, and the two seem to still be engaged in a relationship. They have authored a book together called Ritual that explains the art of black magic. Damien also authored a book in prison. He started a podcast on YouTube called Not Just Idle Chatter, but he hasn't uploaded to that channel for a few years. Now, the older episodes are still available, so if you want to go look for them, they're out there. And what about Jason Baldwin? Well, he lives in Austin, Texas, and has co-founded an organization called Proclaim Justice, which dedicates their work to helping the wrongfully convicted. Jason has been working on his law degree since founding the organization, and that organization, according to the website, is currently working on seven potential wrongful convictions, some of them from West Memphis. He also actively opposes the death penalty. Damien and Jason are no longer close since being released from prison. It's reported that the two had a disagreement while working on the documentary Devil's Not, and that they really haven't been able to or wanted to mend the division. And that leaves us with Jesse Miss Kelly. Well, he returned to West Memphis and apparently lives a very quiet life. He does not give interviews, but his former girlfriend has said that Jesse is frustrated that his life has not been as financially profitable since his release, unlike Damien and Jason's. Now, Jesse did not complete any additional schooling while in prison, and Damien and Jason, well, they did. Jesse's father once told a member of the press that the reason his son does not give interviews is because 
the press are the ones who put Jesse behind bars. Now, this case has deep divides. You can find Reddit feeds that are absolutely sure that the three did the murders. And you can also find FBI specialists who are on record saying that there is no way these three carried out the murders. My hope is that Stevie, Michael, and Christopher's families have found their own version of resolution in the murders. One thing is clear, an entire community was scarred in 1993. And now is a perfect time to give you an update to the murder of Lacey Peterson and the appeals that are being presented by her husband, Scott Peterson's defense team. As a brief reminder, Scott was found guilty back in 2004 for two counts of murder in a San Mateo County courtroom. He has spent the last 20 years in prison for killing his 27-year-old wife, Lacey, and their unborn child, Connor. Now, the state claimed that Scott killed the two on Christmas Eve and dumped their bodies in the San Francisco Bay off of his fishing boat. Well, Scott claimed he had seen his wife earlier in the day before he went fishing, but when he returned to his home, the house was empty and his dog was in the backyard and his wife's car was parked in the driveway. Scott said he showered and then visited some neighbors' homes looking for Lacey. He then called Lacey's mom, who said she hadn't heard from her. Well, the bodies of Lacey and the unborn baby named Connor were not found until April of the next year. So that was nearly five months since they had been pronounced missing. Scott was also tried publicly because it was shown he was carrying on an affair with a woman while his pregnant wife was completely unaware. Evidence was shown that Scott was acting like nothing was really going on in his life and that he was still schmoozing with the woman despite searches being conducted for Lacey and Connor. Scott also attempted to flee when the authorities were looking for him, and he was shown to have dyed his hair and gathered documents to leave the area. So he had like two different driver's licenses. He also had a gun. He had $15,000 in cash, three cell phones, some camping gear, and then various medication. Well, when he did flee, he was tracked down in the San Diego area. That was about 400 miles from Modesto. Well, the Los Angeles Innocence Project took on Scott's case. And recently, they have been working to have access to DNA evidence they believe will clear Scott of the murders. They specifically wanted to test 17 items. 11 of those items were found near or with Lacey Peterson's body. They also want to test two items that were recovered from a burglary that happened across the street from the Peterson home and then test four items connected to a torched orange van containing a blood-stained mattress. So what were those things that were found near Lacey's body in the water? Well, specifically, a piece of duct tape that was attached to Lacey's pants. The strip of tape was tested and human DNA was found, but the contributor could not be identified. Now, the defense is fighting for that tape to be retested with new technology and also a much broader database to compare to. Well, currently, a judge has ruled that only the tape will be retested, not any of the other stuff, not the stuff in the orange van, not the stuff from the burglary, just the tape. And the Innocence Project would also like interviews to be conducted with neighbors who saw Lacey walking the family dog after Scott left to go fishing on that Christmas Eve. The Innocence Project claims if even one of those eyewitness accounts can be proven legitimate, then there's no way Scott could have committed the murders. Scott has achieved success in some realms. In 2020, his death sentence was overturned at the California Supreme Court. His sentence was changed to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But that success didn't continue because in 2022, Scott was denied another trial. His team was asserting that a juror did not reveal the domestic violence that they had suffered, and therefore that juror could not be impartial. The court did not agree with that assertion. Scott is serving his time currently in the Mule Creek State Prison with about 4,000 other felons. He is now 51 years old. And of course, I have to give you an update on Casey Anthony, the mother who was accused of murdering her three-year-old daughter, Kaylee. Casey works as a legal assistant for Patrick McKenna, who was a part of her legal team back when the whole trial was happening. She also does some small accounting work as well. 
Alexandra Dean, who worked on the documentary about Casey, told BuzzFeed that Casey lives a small life with a handful of close friends, and those friends include members of her defense team. Alexandra said Casey does still talk with her mother and very infrequently her brother, but the conversations don't happen often. She said she wouldn't call their relationships close. In 2020, Casey filed paperwork to launch her own private investigative firm named Case Research and Consulting Services. I did a brief and quick search for the firm and it didn't turn up anything, so I'm not sure she is still working the business. Several documentaries have been made about Casey. They included Casey Anthony's Parents, The Lie Detector Test, which was released this year, and then also Casey Anthony, Where the Truth Lies, which was released late last year. In that documentary, Casey speaks for the first time in a televised interview since being acquitted for the October 2008 death of her daughter. Now, the docuseries allows Casey to basically just tell her side of the story and also to float alternate theories that include some finger pointing at her father. She claimed her father handed her a soaking wet and dead Kaylee that he had pulled out of the pool. She told filmmakers that he then told her it was her fault that Kaylee had died. Casey also doubled down on accusations that George sexually abused her as a child. Now, the docuseries also features interviews with a few friends and with key members of her legal team. Casey's trial was one of the most watched in history, with an estimated 40 million Americans viewing at least a portion of the trial. And also, if you don't remember, Casey wasn't found completely guilt-free in her 2011 trial. She was found not guilty for the death of her daughter, but she was found guilty of four misdemeanor counts of providing false information to a law enforcement officer. Now, those charges stemmed from Casey lying repeatedly to law enforcement about where her daughter was and also where she worked and lived. Now, Casey only served about two weeks in jail for those charges after she was found guilty of them. The judge apparently took credit for all of the time she had spent in jail prior to the trial. So after the trial, she only spent two weeks in jail. Now, George and Cindy, okay, remember that's Casey's parents, well, they're still married and they live in Florida. Her brother Lee has started a family of his own and has a very, very distant relationship with Casey. And some outlets report that Casey has only seen Lee's son once during that lifetime. Now, other than that, Casey is leading a very quiet, very silent life. I think she speaks only on the terms that she can establish. She's not going to go out there and really show herself. And I can't imagine what it's like for her, whether or not you believe she's guilty or not. I can't imagine what it's like for her. All right. Well, that was your special Monday episode of Rise and Crime. If you're loving the content, please share this show with a friend. And we always love five-star reviews and positive comments. And like and follow on all of our social media and YouTube accounts that we have here at Oh No Media. It really helps Into the Dark, Murder with My Husband, and Rise and Crime Grow. Join me again on Thursday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.